Yes. All right. All right, way to go, you guys. You can have a seat. We're just going to do one more song before we welcome John up to bring us the message this morning. And this will just give you a moment to quiet your heart, recalibrate your mind a little bit. Prepare to hear from God's word this morning. This is a new song that I've been personally loving just in its simplicity. So we want to teach it to you this morning. I think you'll all be able to catch on to the chorus real easy. So let's just sing that first and then we'll go into the verses. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one of hearts that Just sing that again. Oh, Jesus, we love you. away.
we do, we love you this morning. As we feel your breeze on our skin, as we hear the waves, we gaze at the beautiful mountains. God, we love you because you're our creator, God. And we love you because we are so unworthy and yet you came to save us and you're our savior, God. God, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your mercies that are new every morning, new this morning. We praise you and we ask you to open our eyes to see you better this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll use this. Good morning. How many of you, this is your first church on the beach ever? Like, this is my, oh my goodness, uh, welcome to Church on the Beach. That is so fantastic. We are so thrilled that you decided to spend your Sunday morning with us. It's, uh, it's good to be home for me. I've been gone for nine days, and uh, isn't it true when you travel, it's fun to travel, but it, isn't it great to come back to Santa Barbara? It's just like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I'm, I'm working right now. This is incredible. But you know, more than even coming back to Santa Barbara, home for me is coming home to my wife, to my daughter, to our family, but this is our family. The Bible says that the church is a family, a second family. And uh, it's so uh, terrific to be a pastor and to feel part of the family, to feel like when you're gone, you're missed, and, and when you're here, you feel loved and encouraged and strengthened. And this is such a terrific church family to be a part of, and it, it, it's so good to be home. I, uh, I was with, uh, there were seven guys from this church that spent the last uh, eight, nine days in upstate New York, and we were canoeing. I know, people from Santa Barbara, we're not really canoers, but uh, we launched out on a three-day canoe trip, the first part of uh, what is now called the Northern Forest Canoe Trail they've created, 740 miles of lakes and rivers in, uh, in the upper East New England area. And, uh, and we tackled the first leg of, of the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. And I'm telling you, it, it, to me this trip, and then after that, we went into Lake Placid and we cycled uh, in the Adirondacks for four days. And you know what the trip was about? Two words, stretching and sharing. Stretching through physically stretching, pushing ourselves, canoeing in the wind is uh, a challenge, bicycling up some white-faced mountain is a challenge, especially when you don't know that's in front of you and they tell you after. Uh, but but, but it wasn't, no, not only was it stretching physically, it was stretching relationally. We had excavation questions, three questions a day. We call them excavation questions where you just peek and press a little bit deeper into getting to know each other. And so we spent time in the canoes and on the bikes discussing the excavation questions. So we were stretching ourselves through authenticity and, and through transparency and opening ourselves up to one another, which is a healthy thing for guys to do, by the way. But then there was also a stretch in, in the trip spiritually. And uh, I have a, a, a practice that when I take people away, there's no talking before 8 o'clock in the morning. It's silent. It's quiet. You get up. You get your cup of coffee. You gra I, I put together a little journal and spiritual guide. And you read the scripture and you reread the scripture. And then you reflect on the questions in your journal. And, and so we have quiet in the morning. And then we come together and we discuss it and we talk about it and how... How's God speaking to your heart this morning through this passage? And how's God speaking to you on this trip through creation, nature? How's God speaking to you through conversations with your, your other guy buddies and brothers on this trip? And so it was a trip of stretching and a trip of sharing, as I've explained. Stretching and sharing. And I think a trip like that is, is a little bit of the ethos of who Ocean Hills is. This is a church that wants to help you stretch you know, stretching creates growth physically. You know that, right? And when we stretch relationally and we take risks and we ask each other questions and we respond with... There, there's growth that happens when we're transparent. And there's growth that happens when we stretch. And some of the guys on the trip were reading the Bible going, dude, I don't get it. 
I don't get it. Or, hey, could you pray for us? No, I'm going to pass. And other guys, oh, I'm comfortable praying. And, and that is such a, I think, a reflection of our community that we have people that are in so many different places on this journey. And the journey, though, points to Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about today. If you look at your notes, it, uh, the title is The Foolishness of the Cross. The Foolishness of the Cross. And... For those of you that don't know me, by the way, my name's John, and I'm one of the pastors on the staff here. Uh, so many of you that are new, uh, John Ireland, and uh, just so fun to be here. How many of you are familiar with the card game Hearts? You ever play Hearts? I grew up playing that game with my family, and I, I remember when it was first introduced to me, and I remember my dad saying, two of clubs leads. And I'm like, Why? Why the two of clubs leads? Why does the two of clubs go first? And then as you learn the game, you realize that the bigger numbers, you have to play according to uh, whether it be spades or hearts or diamonds or clubs. And you have to stay in suit when you play. And the larger number takes the smaller number, right? That's the rules. But why? Who made that up? Why, why do the larger numbers beat the smaller numbers? And there's... A secret. Dirty Dora. You guys know Dirty Dora? Dirty Dora is the queen of spades. Why? Why the queen? Why not the queen of hearts? Why not the jack of clubs? I don't know. Whoever created the game created the rules, right? And if somebody dumps Dirty Dora on you, it's 13 hearts against you. And as you are introduced to this game of hearts, you start scratching your head. It can feel confusing. You can kind of sit there and go, I don't, I don't really get it. And then, and then beyond that, I remember the first time that my brother shot the moon. It's like, what? Wait, wait what, what do you mean? He took all the hearts. He took the 13 hearts and he took the, the, the queen of spades, Dirty Dora. He had 26 hearts against him, but... The paradox, the upside down thinking of hearts is, if you take all the hearts, you don't get any of the hearts. The other players get all of those hearts against them. It's like confusing, like, wait a minute, I thought you didn't want to get hearts. No, you don't, but if you get all the hearts, then everybody else gets all the hearts again. Are you confused? Raise your hand, yeah. That's what happens when you learn a new game sometimes. It doesn't make sense. You're scratching your head. You're going, well, that's kind of ridiculous. The two of clubs leads or dirty Dora, the queen of spades is 13 hearts against you. So why isn't it the queen of hearts? But whoever created that game created the rules. And the Bible teaches us that we have a creator, created the universe, created spiritual laws and relational laws for how life works, how relationships work, and how we can connect with our Creator, the living God. And if you begin to read the Bible, for some of you, you'll begin to understand that there's a lot of paradoxes in the Bible. It's full of paradoxes. There's this kind of backwards, upside-down uh, thinking. And in fact, let me just read for you some of these paradoxes that, that actually when you hear them, they sound confusing at first. If you don't get the game, so to speak, if you don't get the book, you don't get the rules, you don't get the guidelines, you don't get how to live this life and play this game called life, it can feel confusing. Because we live in a world that teaches a different message. But the God of the scripture, his message is kind of upside down and backwards from the ways of this world that we live in. Listen to this. This is what Jesus taught. This is what the Bible teaches. If you want to be great, become a servant. Wait, what? You want to become great, become a servant? No, no, no. I want people to serve me. I don't want to serve. Jesus said, no, you want to become great, become a servant. How about this one? If you want to live a rich life, become poor in spirit. Wait, what? Because Why? That doesn't make sense. If you want to be first, be last. If you want to grow up and mature spiritually, 
Become like a child. Become childlike. If you want to be free, who doesn't want freedom? Become a slave of Christ. Wait a minute. Are you serious? I want to be free, but I have to become a slave? Are you with me? Is it confusing? Are you going, I'm not sure I get that. In dying to yourself, there is real life. You're raised up to life, the Bible says. I have to die to myself daily, to my selfishness, but when I do that, God lifts me up. In fact, in humility... If you choose to live with humility, the Bible says you will be exalted. In other words, if you choose downward mobility, God will raise you up. He'll exalt you. In weakness, there is strength. In giving, I receive. And just over and over and over, there are these paradoxes. And here's the ultimate paradox in the Bible. It's through the death of Jesus on the cross. It's through that death of one man that everyone else on the planet is given new life if they'll open themselves and receive that message, if they'll believe that message. Through the death of Jesus on the cross, his death leads to everybody else experiencing life. That sounds crazy, right? I mean, it just sounds confusing. It's like ridiculous. It's nonsense, right? And in our sophisticated and educated and progressive and somewhat smug Southern California, Santa Barbara culture, God's wisdom that I've just laid out, God's wisdom is thought of as foolishness, nonsense. That's ridiculous. And in fact, in our passage, if you have uh, the scripture on your program there, it says this in verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Meaning, we're all dying, but if we choose to turn our back on God, if we choose to say, I don't, I don't want a God life. To those of us that live that way, the message of the cross, is, it's just nonsense. It's like, dude... Are you serious? You believe that stuff? But to those who are being saved, and that, 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 that word, that phrase, being saved means a process of daily dying to yourself and saying yes to God. That's what it means to this phrase of those who are being saved. Those of us who get it, who have eyes that see, and we go, oh, the message of the scripture, the upside down, backwards, paradoxical thinking of the Bible is, I die daily to myself, and that's a process, so that I can come alive and God can live not only in me, but through me. And so it's this message that's foolishness to those who don't believe. And in our culture, the cross is... Ridiculous. So here's what Paul does. If you look at the passage that I've listed there, he's appealing to this paradox as he addresses this struggling young church in Corinth. It's an immature church. It's in uh, a city back in the ancient Near East. Lori, uh, last week, launched our series. We're in 1 Corinthians. But let me just briefly tell you that Corinth was a city that had a bustling commerce. It was a cool city, a port city. It, um, it had people that were kind of living out that eagle's tune, life in the fast lane. You know what I'm talking about? That is, in fact, uh, Chuck Swindoll says the book of Corinthians should be called the book of Californians. And uh, it was the people that were living a fast life. And the church in that community was falling apart. Through divisions, they were arguing about theological differences, lifestyle differences. There was blatant uh, sexual immorality, no boundaries at all in any way. They were power grabbing. There was this infighting. And maybe we could just describe the church in that city, in that culture as dysfunctional, right? It's not a church you'd want to be a part of. And what Paul does is he says, I want you to reimagine life. I want you to reimagine church life together. 
living and leaning into this paradoxical, this upside down way of thinking. First of all, you embrace the death of Jesus on the cross, that he died for your sin, your selfishness, this disease that every one of us was born with. Mine, me, it's all about I. That's the Holy Trinity, me, myself, and I. That's, that's how we all are. We want it our way. We don't want somebody else telling us how to live, telling us what to do. And that rebellion is a disease in us that we all have, which is, it's the disease called sin. And Paul says, you know what? God has an answer for that problem, and I want you to think about it by embracing the cross. I know it sounds foolish, but I want you to embrace it. I want you to open your up to it, and I want you to let it revolutionize your life. It's not a ridiculous message. It's actually a revolutionary message that will transform you. Five times, if you look in that passage, five times there's one word that occurs, and it occurs in different forms. In verse 25, it appears as an adjective in the Greek language, moros. It's where we get the English word moron. Foolishness is the word, foolish. And it has the idea of something that's ridiculous, nonsense. You're a moron if you believe this stuff. That, in a sense, is what Paul is saying. You believe what's in here? What are you, a moron? Right? We get that language. And let me just let me just say that Paul is saying that those who don't believe, they, he's saying they don't understand it. It makes no sense that a savior would die for them. It's ridiculous. And then he goes on to say, listen to this in verse 23. We preach, we proclaim Christ crucified. That's on the cross. And then here's the phrase, a stumbling block to Jewish people and foolishness to Gentiles. I had to ask myself, why? Why is it a stumbling block to Jewish people, foolishness to Gentiles? Well, the Jews stumbled over the cross because they were looking for a conquering king. They were looking for a political leader who would deliver them from the heel of the Roman Empire. And they just couldn't imagine. It just wasn't in their frame of thinking, in the realm in any place in their mind, they could not imagine a crucified Messiah. It was a contradiction in terms. It was upside down thinking. And it was a complete scandal, according to the Jewish people. How could an all-conquering Messiah die on a cross? So the message of the cross didn't make sense. It's ridiculous, foolish. You're a moron if you think that. But then what about the Greeks? The Gentiles, they were another matter. They had, and I think they represent more of our community, they had this intellectual curiosity. They looked to philosophy and education as the answer to life's deepest problems and challenges. The notion of a man hanging on a cross to reconcile the world to himself, it was utter nonsense. Like, you're a moron if you believe this stuff. And so my question is, do, so do we just throw out our minds? Do we chuck our intellect to become a Christian? Do I got to stop becoming a, a thinking person? Some of us have been accused of that. I've been accused of that. Some of you have had people tell you, you know, I thought you were a little more open-minded than that. You believe